Okay, I'm gonna moon you. Are you ready? Close your eyes if you don't wanna see a big bright mooning. Boom! That's a moon. That's Ganymede. This is also a moon. This is Phobos. Cool, right? Our moon is just called the moon, which is a bit presumptuous, actually, but you could also call it Luna if you want. That's Latin for moon, which some cultures use. Just don't call it a planet. This is the current International Astronomical Union's definition of a planet. So let's have a little thought experiment, okay? Let's say the moon were to fly off on its own, like zoom out of the solar system. Here on Earth, of course, everybody dies. But what happens to that little moon? What does it become? You know, because it's still not a planet, but it's like, it's not a moon either. Uh... A new paper from earlier this year has a name for this new non-planet moon, and needless to say, I have questions. Are you ready? Because this is a great name. It's not a planet. It's not a moon. It's not an asteroid or a meteor or a celestial rogue. The name for this thing is... Plunit. <laughs> oh my god. Hi Moonies, Prongs here, uh, Trace here. Thanks for watching Unidose of Trace. I really love that you are here to learn along with me. Welcome new subscribers, 25,000 subscribers. My heart is soaring. Thank you so much. <sighs> okay. Recently, I read a paper in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society from August of 2019, and I was like, I have to tell everybody about this. This is crazy. Plunits? Plunits? This is embarrassing for everyone involved, and it's hilarious, and I love it. It's not actually embarrassing. It's great. How did we end up here, though? I'll get there. But first, I have to talk about how solar systems form. I know, astronomy is a lot. In the beginning, there was darkness and a lot of matter. Slowly, over way more than a week, a bunch of the atoms of hydrogen started to coalesce like water in a small bowl. As more and more gas and dust fell together, joined by its shared gravity, it ignited, becoming a star. The gravity of this gas turned this mess of matter into a protoplanetary disk, a fetal solar system. Then more matter started to coalesce into planets and asteroids and everything else in a solar planetary system. Sorry. As new planets form in a protoplanetary disk, some are gonna float toward or away from their original orbit in the cloud due to their gravitational forces. This is called planetary migration. Think about it like this. This is the Nice model of planetary migration, and it says that Neptune and Uranus formed much closer to the sun, and that Neptune was actually closer than Uranus at one point, but eventually they both migrated outwards to where they are in orbit today. We've seen evidence of planetary migration in other solar systems, like Kepler-223, where the planets are in resonance, i.e. for every orbit of one planet, a neighbor planet will orbit twice. Astronomers spotted this idea at Jupiter long ago and realize three of Jupe's moons are in resonance as well. Seeing it elsewhere makes them think that our solar system used to have resonant orbits too, but for some reason, the larger gas giants were knocked out of resonance to the orbits that they have today. The point here is that orbits can change. So we've got planets, they're forming in this cloud of protoplanetary debris, and we've got orbits that can change over time, remaking solar systems all over the universe. Now we add in observations of exoplanets. We've been looking at the stars and finding so many alien planets that we haven't even been able to study them all yet. We've spotted over 4,000 planets around other stars so far and confirmed a lot of them. What we haven't spotted yet are moons exomoons at least, not yet. And I'm pretty sure you see where this is going. Moons also formed from protoplanetary disks, but they didn't gather enough material quick enough to be a planet. And instead they were pulled or captured by the gravity of nearby bodies and relegated to be celestial sidekicks. For now, keep that in mind. Over billions of years, planets don't tend to float outwards away from their stars. They don't disappear into the space around solar systems. Instead, they tend to orbit inwards, falling towards their stars, which is how some think we ended up with hot Jupiters, a class of gas giant exoplanets that orbit very close to their star, like in less than 10 days, that's very close and they're very hot. When a planet gets that close, this paper theorizes, it needs to shed its exomoons. But where do those moons go? What happens to them? Do they leave the family and get their own franchise like Hydra and Spondy? Let's furiously fast forward to 2006. Moons are round. Generally, they've cleared their orbit. But they don't orbit the sun, they orbit a planet. So under the IAU definition, they are not planets. 
But what if a moon isn't orbiting its planet anymore? What happens if one of those moons gets fed up with cats jumping over it and playing second fiddle and they just want to go solo? We've never actually observed this happening, but we know that it can happen. So we need a name for this specific scenario. And that name, as weird as it may be, is Plunit. Plunits may get their own franchise, but it all comes back to family. So even though they haven't been seen, we know that Plunits could exist. The problem is Plunits are not long for this universe. Once a moon has been spun off from its host planet, it can be torn apart by tidal forces of other planets, eaten by another gas giant or even the star itself. It could even be tossed entirely out of the solar system into interstellar space, become like a rogue moon. That said, there are some Plunits that are theorized to last for several million years and gather new dust and gas still available from the leftovers of the protoplanetary disk. And if they do that, they might be able to upgrade themselves to a capital P planet. And now you see the problem. Astronomers need specificity. This isn't a moon being destroyed by its planet friend. It's not a rogue moon. It's something different and it needs to go on to have a new life as a planet, but scientists needed a new word to describe these orphaned celestial bodies. You could feel however you want about the word that they proposed, plunit. But these astronomers are saying we call them plunits because they are not a moon anymore and they might someday get to be a planet. Although it's kind of unlikely. And again, we've never actually seen one of these things in the universe. What we have seen though, is a bunch of strange anomalies in other solar systems with planet spotting space telescopes like Kepler. And those anomalies, they think, might be explained by these moons, uh, well, plunits, <laughs> that have been destroyed or they're messing with the gravitational interactions of the planets around distant stars that we can see. Now, I can understand what these astronomers are doing with plunits, hopefully you can too. It's a mix of planet and moon, but like, couldn't we mix a cooler word like moon and asteroid? Wouldn't that be better? It gives us some way cooler wombinations like masteroid. It's like an asteroid, but it's a former moon with a heart of vengeance. Moonsteroid. It's neither a moon nor an asteroid, and it's terrorizing its planetary system until a planet arrives to put it in its place. Asteroon, that special time in a galactic day when we all sit and have a lovely spot of tea and Martian cucumber sandwiches. Any of these words are better, so I'm gonna go ahead and tweet a poll and see what people think, but in the end, moons are weird, right? Like when you really think about it, moons are relegated to this second class celestial body. Planets, they get all depressed, but moons can be very planet-like, and sometimes that makes them even more interesting. We love to talk about life on Mars, which is a planet, but it's far more likely that we're gonna find life on Europa, which is just a little old moon. Titan is actually larger than Mars, and it has more atmosphere than Earth. It's also just a moon, so it's not as interesting. Ganymede is larger than both the planet Mercury and the dwarf planet Pluto. It's only a bit smaller than the planet Mars, and yet it's still just a moon, so, Meh. Moons are amazing, and they deserve our love and respect, and they deserve to be explored. Exomoons too. Exomoons haven't even been spotted yet. They're really small. But once we do, if the moons in our own solar system are any example, then we are gonna find some amazing things. In the end, whatever we wanna call them, planets are showing us that solar systems are not as unchanging as we would think. When you look at those wire models where all the planets are in stationary orbits, remember, that's not real. Things change, planets shift, moons get thrown hither and thither. Nothing lasts forever, you know, except our curiosity. Curiosity is at the center of everything I do. So when Curiosity Stream approached me to like partner up, I was like, yes, please. Curiosity Stream is a streaming service with learning about ourselves, our planet, and our universe at its heart. If you join Curiosity Stream with my link plus my promo code, it will support the making of this show. You get a free month. And not only do you get Curiosity Stream, but you get Nebula for free too. Nebula is another streaming service that is owned by and directly benefits me and other learning creators. Seriously, you get that with Curiosity Stream. All you gotta do, sign up for them, you get a month free, and you get Nebula included. The icy places of our planet are some of the most fascinating to me, especially in an era of global warming, so I really enjoyed Curiosity Stream's expedition Antarctica. 
about the many living things that exist on our planet's southern continent. It's super well made, it's really interesting. Also, I talked about working titles recently. You can find that on Nebula, and you can watch both of those just by joining Curiosity Stream. Just go to curiositystream.com slash trace, use the promo code trace, and for only $2.99 a month, you're gonna get both Curiosity Stream's massive library, and you directly support creators that you already love with Nebula, which directly supports the making of more Uno Dose of Trace. So it's actually like a double win. Thanks. Okay, so Plunits. <laughs> Make sure you fill out that poll. Thank you so much for watching Uno Dose of Trace. I really appreciate it. Thank you for subscribing, for sharing the channel. I think in 2020, we're really gonna blow this thing out of the water. Even if the Plunets thing was not the best name, let me know what you think the best name is in the comments. I'm a big fan of Moonsteroid. Kinda sounds like a cool band. Okay, I'll see you in the future. <laughs>